my brothers and sisters. It's been a few days and I've really missed um, doing my videos and catching up with you all. Um, tonight, I want to bring you guys something that when I started at the chapel, I really wanted to read this and because um, they sell a book or they, they have a book in the chapel called Sargon the Magnificent. And I was so interested to read this book. So I finally found it anyway. And um, it is pretty long, but um, it's so, so interesting. And I would like to read it. Um, I would like to also say that in this document, there is um, some words that could offend people. And I that is not my intention at all. I solely, I solely want to do this for um, educational purposes only. And I hope that is made clear um, to everyone and they don't think that, you know, there's any bad intentions or negative intentions with this whatsoever. It's just history and it's so interesting. So... Um, I'm going to, I think because it's, there's five parts to it and because it's such a long document, I think what I'm going to do is probably do two halves of one part or maybe even break it into three because I just don't know. Like it's, it's pretty long, but I've read uh, most of it and it's so interesting. So I'm going to start reading. And like I said, it talks about, um, the black race being an inferior race, and um, they called them uh, by a name which today probably doesn't sound that nice, but it, it's not anything um, that derogatory. It's just basically, I believe in those days when they would see something, um, like we have words for colors like black, white, um, red, green, and I think in I know in the Hebrew um, they don't have actual colors uh, descriptions. They have so what they see or what they get from that color, it's a description of what they see. So yeah, I'm gonna start reading, and um, I hope you guys enjoy it because I think it's really some great great research been done, and um, there's a lot of uh, evidence that they've dug up the archaeologists and stuff. So I'm going to start reading and we shall begin. And again, if the audio tends to go in and out, I will pause if I need to make any big movements or anything. I don't have the headphones plugged in, so hopefully it should be okay. Um, but when I move the mouse and scroll up and down, I will pause. Okay, so here we go. Sargon the Magnificent. Great floods have flown from, single, from simple sources and great seas have dried when miracles have by the greatest been denied. It has been said that nothing, hold on, let me make this bigger. Okay. It has been said that nothing worth proving can be proved, and certainly this applies to the theory put forward in this little book. But I hope to interest the reader in my attempt to show that the stories told in the first chapters of Genesis harmonize with the researches of modern archaeologists and provide a key to some otherwise unsolved problems. It has not been easy to marshal the massive evidence collected here, and a certain amount of reiteration of arguments and facts has been been unavoidable, but I dare to think that after a careful and open-minded consideration of these pages, some, at least of my readers, will be convinced that that mysterious personage, the great Babylonian monarch Sargon of Akkad, was none other than the first murderer in history, Cain. By showing that Cain and Sargon were one and the same, and thus linking up the sacred and profane histories of the ancient world, I hope to refute the modern teaching that the Bible story of the Garden of Eden is mythical. And uh, up to the present, the Babylonian inscriptions and drawings have interested comparatively few people. But those who accept my theory that Sargon of Akkad, who plays so large a part in them, was Cain, will agree that they should be of universal interest for granting this, there emerges from the tangled mass of evidence provided by those inscriptions and drawings a vast and sinister figure whose influence upon mankind far eclipses that of any other character in secular history. 
I shall endeavor to show that to his superhuman knowledge must be attributed, <clears throat> excuse me, the prehistoric civilizations now known to have existed in different parts of the globe, as well as the savage bar barbarism which accompanied them, and that to him must be also attributed. <clears throat> About 30 years ago, in a series of lectures, a certain German professor, himself a higher critic, announced his belief in the divine inspiration of the first chapters of Genesis. His regret at the attacks being made upon their authenticity by other professors and his conviction that if a certain discovery could be made, it would largely help to counteract those attacks. He apparently did not expect that such a discovery would be made, but I hope to show that when the cuneiform inscriptions found in Babylonia and now available for anyone's inspection are studied from a new point of view, that discovery is ours. In support of this new viewpoint, in support of this new point of view, extracts from works leading Assyriologists are quoted in the following pages, and their translations of the inscriptions are given. It can scarcely be thought presumptuous on my part if I suggest a new application of those inscriptions, considering that the deductions already drawn from them are indeterminate and unconvincing. While taking advantage of them, I make bold to suggest that their decipherers, like others before them, may sometimes have failed to see the woods for the trees. That the writers, from whose works I quote, hold different views from my own, naturally makes any of their evidence that supports my views the more convincing because it is involuntary. Since the history which they have deduced from Babylonian inscriptions is admittedly conjectural and rests upon a certain hypothesis described by one of them as almost incredible, it is well that some other hypothesis should be tested, and I claim that my new version of Babylonian history rests upon a much more reasonable one. That a new interpretation should be welcome is suggested by Professor Sace's words. Both in Egypt and Babylonia, therefore, we are thrown back up on the monumental texts which the excavator has recovered from the soil, and the decipherer has pieced together with infinite labor and patience. The conclusions we, must, the conclusions we form must, to a large extent, be theoretically attributed to the institution of idolatry, that poison chalice, the golden cup of Babylon, which made all the earth drunken in olden times and whose dregs have still power to work mischief among men. See, you guys, this stuff is so interesting to me. And I noticed something. I don't believe this is a coincidence either. Um, two days ago, I spoke, I was in a, a kind of debate kind of thing or a, a kind of back, back, backwards and forwards um, about this guy was an atheist because he thought that the Bible was from uh, the Babylonian uh, idolatry that they do is, is, is similar. So anyway, we're going to find out why it's so similar. And um, yeah, there's quite a few atheists that actually use this that um, the Bible or the Old Testament is a copy of the Babylonian, um, you know, idolatry, whatever kind of gods they worship, that there's a lot of similarities, too many similarities, and that they must have been started in Babylonia and we've copied it. But no, the, and this absolutely is a perfect thing to, you know, show them that no, that's just not the case. So yeah, I don't believe that was a coincidence that I started reading this two days after I had that debate with the atheists and um, they were using, yeah, um, Babylonian uh, idolatry uh, kind of, you know, is what they, they think the Bible followed. And because there's too many similarities, that's what they say. But this is going to refute that big time. So that's why I believe now <clears throat> this is not what the atheists can use as an excuse anymore. Okay, so I just wanted to throw that in there because it is a big thing. You know, if you think, wow, well, if it is that much alike, like a lot of people will say the, the story of Jesus um, being born in a virgin, they say that <clears throat> that actually is a lot like the Greek mythology or something. But no, there's reasons these stories came down and it's going to show us why in this. So it's it's very good to know all this, what um, this article is about. It's very good to know for the, for the deeper student, of course. 
Okay, so I'm going to continue, guys. Sorry about that little interval there. Okay. And the, okay. Although modern scholars seem to ignore the possibility that Cain may have influenced the history of the ancient world, three notable writers at the beginning of the Christian era, St. Jude, Josephus, and Philo, suggested that Cain's influence was evil and enduring, while a modern poet reminds us that somewhere in the world, Cain's descendants must have worked out their tragic destiny. Lord Byron makes Lucifer say to Cain, Firstborn of the first man, thy present state of sin, and thou art evil, of sorrow, and thou sufferest, are both Eden in all its innocent, compared to what thou shortly mayest be, and that state again in its redoubled wretchedness, a paradise to what thy sons, 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 accumulating in generations like to dust, which they in fact but add to, shall endure and do. Now let us back to earth. And back to earth we, shall, we too shall come. To make poetry about Cain is one thing. To install him suddenly in secular history or to try to do so is another. This book is inevitably controversial and my task has been no light one in writing it. For I try as it were to build up on a site already occupied and to clear the site while building. When I add that the building to be cleared away is, in plain language, certain views set forth by well-known writers, my difficulties will, I am sure, be fully appreciated. I do appreciate that because so many people went against this theory and still do. The courage required for such a formidable undertaking comes from those discoveries, but also from the book of Genesis. This conviction, which I regard as my strength, will undoubtedly be looked upon by some people as a weakness, for it is now the fashion to decry the first chapters of Genesis, to ignore the possibility of their divine inspiration, to treat their historical information as fabulous, and to consider it unintelligent to believe in anything of a miraculous nature. It is taught sometimes, even by the clergy, that the Old Testament stories owe their origin to the pagan traditions of Babylonia. But my object is to show that the beliefs and institutions of ancient Babylonia and of other lands as well confirm the historical truth of the Bible instead of discrediting it. I maintain that unless, unless we accept its stories as true history, we are although ever learning, never able to come to a knowledge of truth. I completely agree. <clears throat> the men who ignore these stories are, however, accepted as authorities. They carry weight and have the public ear. It may indeed seem bold to question their conclusions. These, however, fortunately for my purpose, do not always agree and are often indefinite and liable to be changed at any time to suit new theories brought forward. Sir James Fraser, for instance, has lately thrown doubt upon the prevailing opinion held by Assyriologists that the Babylonian myths upon which the Genesis stories are supposed to be modeled were evolved, <coughs> excuse me, were evolved by the first inhabitants of that land and has suggested instead that they may have originated in Africa traveled thence into Babylonia, and later on have found their way into the Hebrew literature. This conjecture he bases on the recent discovery that traditions reminiscent of that literature, such as those of a fall of man and a serpent tempter, exist among the tribes of the Tanga Tangaika territory in Africa. Considering, however, that the earliest rulers in Egyptian history are now believed to have gone into Africa from Asia, it is surely on the face of it and much more probable that those stories were taken by them into Africa and there corrupted into the grotesque traditions found among the African tribes. By comparing and contrasting the biblical and Babylonian stories, and by bringing forward fresh evidence, or at least evidence which has so far passed unnoticed, I hope to show that the Bible stories do not owe their origin to Babylonian myths and legends, but they are, on the contrary, true history. 
the Babylonian inscriptions. Before looking for Cain in the Babylonian inscriptions, a short account of those inscriptions, of their arrival in England and America, and of the effect they produced there must be given. On the side of the palace of King Asher Bani Pal, where once has stood the city of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, thousands of brick tablets have been found, upon some of which, inscribed in cuneiform characters, are mythological versions of the stories told in the book of Genesis about the creation of the world, the Garden of Eden, and the Deluge. The date of the tablets is thought to be about 700 BC, and they are believed to be copies of much older writings, which Asur Banipal has had caused to be collected from all parts of his kingdom and stored in his library. Many of these fragments were brought to England towards the end of the last century, and the late Mr. George Smith of the British Museum was the first to transliterate and make known to the public these Genesis stories. Although these Babylonian stories are replete with the names of gods and goddesses, they are in some ways so like those in the first chapters of Genesis that they were joyfully received at, the fir at first as new evidence of truth of the Bible records. Also, guys, um, just to inter intervene one second, um, as I read, there's going to be some little parentheses with um, where they got the information from and who wrote the, inf you know, what books or whatever, uh, as you can see here, sermons from pulpit. And then it tells you where uh, 1887 uh, Q4 inscription contained. So it's going to show you little areas where um, they've been, where you can get the references, basically. And I'm going to skip over those, okay, guys? And um, as you can probably pause the video and check them out for yourself, if you would wish, uh, I'm just going to keep on reading from the uh, actual, you know, uh, the, continue with the story, because I, I don't want to interrupt the paragraphs with the references, but you guys could take those down um, and kind of pause the video if you wish. Okay, so where did we leave off? This is stories. Okay, uh, the Bible records. Yeah. And then, so that's why I said that. At first, um, at first there's new evidence of, of the truth of the Bible records, and then it'll go into Professor Cattell of Leopard Rights. Um, I'm just going to read this actually real quick. Professor Cattell of Lepe, Leipzig writes, When therefore George Smith was fortunate enough to discover in the year 1887 cuneiform inscriptions containing the account of the flood, the expressions of delight beyond the channel and Atlantic knew no bounds. Sermons from the pulpit and whole columns from the daily press were filled with accounts of the discovery. Every doubt of the skeptic and every sneer of the mocker, it was thought, in regard to the Bible, would be utterly and inevitably confounded. In 1903, he wrote, A very different picture presents itself before our eyes today. A period of sobriety and in many cases of depression has followed that of jubilation and enthusiasm. In the family of Oriental studies, Assyriology is the latest born. It need not be a matter of wonder. Therefore, if in, in individual instances, instances, representatives of the new knowledge should not have always been able to shake off the childlike love of sensation, Formerly, men were attracted to the study of monuments with the hope of finding arguments on behalf of the Bible. Now, the contemporaries of Nietzsche and Haeckel find there is a much greater prospect of attention being directed to the new learning if it should succeed in adducing evidence against both the Bible and Christianity. Always some, somebody looking to refute. This is surely a grave accusation. Although so dispassionate in tone, Professor Kittel was one of the first and keenest German higher critics. His work, The History of the Hebrews, was even considered too destructive by our own higher critic, Professor Kelly Chain. The fact that Professor Kittel retained his faith in the divine revelation of the Old Testament stories after analyzing and comparing the biblical and Babylonian versions should carry weight with the most skeptical. So basically, after he did all this work, all this studying, all this research, he, he never lost his faith. So, and when you finish reading this, you know, it, it totally points to, to one thing. Okay. Um, where were we? 
like that. Okay. Okay, the most skeptical. Okay. An examination of the Babylonian story of the creation of the world shows the justice of his opinion that the Assyriologist who first suggested that the writer of Genesis borrowed his ideas from Babylonia did not really believe that proposition, but only wished to advertise their new branch of science. Professor Cattell's summary of the Babylonian story is as follows. When on high, the heavens were not named, and below the firmament was not yet de designated. Then were the gods formed. In the beginning, the chaotic waters, called Tiamat, held sway. They were the enemies of order, as the gods wished to create from these an orderly world. Tiamat arose as a dragon against them. Igno ignominious terror seized the gods until Marduk, the god of the spring sun, undertook to battle with the monster and its companions. He conquered it, cut the dragon into two halves, and made out of one the heavens, and of the other, in like manner, the earth, upon which he then brought forth animals and men. Babylonian. The infusion of which this summary gives some idea is equaled in absurdity, in absurdity by what is called the Sumerian story of the creation of the world, also found in Babylonia and considered to be the origin of the above version and that given in the Old Testament. Nothing like it. To appreciate the absurd, absurdity of the Sumerian version of the creation, etc., Professor Leonard King's work, Legend of Babylon, Babylon and Egypt, should be studied. The first lines are typical, typical of all Sumerian writings. When Anu, Enlil, Enki, and Ninkarsaka created the black-headed, i.e. mankind, to produce the animals, the four-legged creatures of the field, they artfully called into existence. That the sublime account of the creation given in Genesis was inspired by such utter nonsense is surely unthinkable. The perfect agreement of the Bible account with the discoveries of modern science should, one would think, convince anyone that the writer was divinely inspired. Since that perfect agreement is not always realized, the subject is dealt with in Appendix A. In answer to Professor Delch's insinu insinuation that the biblical account of the creation is only a rearrangement of Babylonian myths and that some Israelitish scribes' conception of God was inspired by, by the Babylonian deities, Professor Cattell writes, <clears throat> It must, moreover, be always borne in mind that it is psychologically inconceivable that the lower forms of religion— which are glibly assumed to be the original, such as fetishism, totism, tot totemism, animism, etc., could have come into existence without the previous conception of a higher power behind them, that is, of God himself. That a stick or a stone or an animal could be regarded as God cannot have been a primary, but only at most a secondary conception. Very true. It is certain that to primitive man, a stone in the first instance was a stone, wood was wood, animal, animal. And he could with his own eyes see that these things had no inherent power of themselves to make alive or kill or produce growth. But when once he had or obtained the conception God, he might readily uh, suffer it in course of time to degenerate so that this power, while it is invisible, became associated in his mind with visible things, such as trees, stones, or animals. In the words of the late F. X. F. Max Muller, words often quoted and frequently with contempt, but never yet refut refuted, the human mind would never have conceived the notion of gods if it had not first of all conceived the notion of God. Makes sense to me, guys. Professor Cattell's final conclusion is that the Bible and Babylonian stories all come from the same source and have a common origin from which, proceeding in two streams and subjected to independent development, 
They issue respectively in a nature myth and a monotheistical religion with an ethical base. He describes as follows one way in which the attacks upon the divine origin of the Bible might be successfully combated. This gets really interesting, guys. Trust me on that. There is one problem whose solution would well reward the cuneiform investigator would surpass... I'm going to start over on that. There is one problem whose solution would well reward the cuneiform investigator would surpass all previous discoveries and excuse all disillusions and false conclusions, and that would be the discovery that in the gray dawn of history, there were actually men in existence who still possessed the late inheritance of an exalted knowledge of God, which had at some time or another been imparted to mankind. For that stones or trees or even dead, man, dead men should have awakened in mankind the earliest present, presentiment of God or should have attracted it to themselves, we cannot allow ourselves to be persuaded, no matter how frequently and how loudly this theory is maintained. <clears throat> Professor Cattell has hit upon the only way, as it seems to me, of refuting the attacks upon the authenticity of the Genesis stories. He saw clearly that when that what was wanted to support the Bible testimony in these incredulous days was involuntary evidence from ancient pagan monuments. Although he appears to have had little hope of that evidence being found, I claim that it has been discovered inadvertently and passed over almost without comment because its full significant its full significance has not been recognized. The fact that men who possessed the knowledge of God existed in Babylonia in the great dawn of history is proved by a few cuneiform tablets whose existence I conclude was unknown to Professor Cattell. Their inscriptions strongly resemble the Hebrew literature and betray the knowledge of one God. Although they were found among hundreds of other tablets of an entirely polytheistic character. So in other words, they found all these clay tablets and they were, you know, idolatry worship with all kinds of goddesses and gods. But among those, thousands of them, it said, right? Yeah. The, among those, you had where, uh, I don't know how many that had, only, had recognized just one god. So, okay, that's proof right there in itself that among all the idolatry, somebody knew about the one god. Okay. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Yeah, it's hundreds of other tablets. Okay, these few monotheistic inscriptions, which will be given later, are said by Assyriologists to be copies of much earlier ones, dating back to before 2000 BC. And it is remarkable that the pagan priests who inscribed them finally, and in some cases left their mark upon them, in the 7th century BC, allowed them to come down as evidence that the knowledge of God had one, once existed in their land, where at the time hundreds of false gods were worshipped. When Professor Cattell says this conclusion by historical means, I cannot agree with him. My object is to show that, on the contrary, historical means are at hand if a fresh interpretation is given to the Babylonian inscriptions. And the first question to be discussed is how did the knowledge of God arrive in Babylonia and who took it there? We gather from the Bible that the exalted knowledge of God was handed down by the descendants of Seth, the third son of Adam, and, that, and the ancestor of Noah. And it seems probable that after the deluge, it was preserved by Noah's descendants in northern Syria and made known to Moses by his father-in-law Jethro, the Midianite, who, it seems, may have come from that part of the world. On the other hand, there is ample evidence in the Babylonian inscriptions, if my new interpretation of them is accepted, to prove that the other stream of knowledge was taken into Babylonia by none other than Cain, that it there became obscured by the system of fables and myths now known as mythology, and that it was Cain who originated that system by establishing the first false gods. If this new interpretation is accepted, we have substantial evidence that one of the earliest biblical characters 
played a prominent part in the secular history of the ancient world, and we can reject the assertions that the first chapters of Genesis were derived from Babylonian myths. Like the pieces of a picture puzzle that the evidence lies before us, waiting to be put together, excavators and decipherers have proved, provided the pieces of the puzzle, but it is us for us to make the picture. The Hittites. Dr. Crowley suggests the possibility that the Midianites of the Bible were the Mitanni of northern Syria mentioned in the Amar Amarna tablets. Higher critics admit the probability that Jethro greatly influenced Moses. We read, the, legisla the legislation on Mount Sinai, which apparently occupies a very important place in tradition, is really secondary. More prominence is evidently is more prominence is evidently to be ascribed to the influence of the half-Arabian Jethro, or Hobab. Jethro the Midianite is also called Hobab the Kenite, and we read, variant tradition would seem to show that the Kenites were only a branch of the Midianites. Well, and we also know, guys, that since then we have, um, we have learned a lot more, and we know the, the line of Kenites is from that... Um, the Cain and uh, Satan line. So, yeah, Median Knights are from Kitura. So that wouldn't be the same line unless they intertwine, intermix and stuff. Okay. A necessary explanation. Two of the most recent writers upon the Babylonian inscription unintentionally support Professor Cattell's opinion that the Genesis stories came down in two streams. Listen up, guys. And also my theory that one stream came down through the descendants of Seth and the, other, and the other through Cain in Babylonia. Before quoting their remarks, however, I must explain why they call the first possessors of the very ancient knowledge Semites. For if they were the family of Adam, they should, of course, been called after him, Adamites, and not after Shem, or Sem, who lived much later. The, the Cambridge history tells us that the problem of the term Semitic is acute, that it is more convenient than accurate, and is derived from Shem, a son of Noah, the hero of the deluge. But it offers no solution of the problem. Surely it is the use made of the word which is puzzling, and not the word for itself, for nothing could be more self-evident than its meaning related to Shem or his reputed descendants, why, for instance, do Assyriologists describe Sargon of Akkad as Semitic when, according to the monumental evidence, he lived about 3800 BC, long before Shem's time? The ambiguous use of the word Semite can be traced to two German professors who, about the year 1790, proposed that thenceforth the, the word should mean Oriental. I've never heard that. Unfortunately, later scholars following the German lead used the word Semitic at one time, especially in connection with languages, as meaning Oriental, and at other times as meaning related in some way to Shem, and this causes confusion. If, as I claim, Sargon was Cain, he should be called an Adamite rather than a Semite. And his subjects, who were called Sumerians or Akkadians by Assyriologists on account of their geographic, geographical terms Sumer and Akkad, found in the inscriptions, were, of course, pre Adamites. Okay, guys, so I believe this is talking about the six day creation now. Poets and painters have depicted Cain as going into exile, accompanied by an Adamite wife and family. But the Bible leads us to infer that before the birth of Seth, only Cain and Abel had been born to Adam and Eve. We are prepared, therefore, to find that Cain had settled among a non-Adamite race when he built a city and founded a family. And, as we shall see, modern discoveries go to prove this. Here, pre-Adamites. Here, another digression becomes necessary. It is generally thought that the Bible teaches that Adam was the first human being, but in that case it would seriously contradict itself in the fourth chapter of Genesis, although the chapter contains, as one of the largest dis dis dissectors of the Bible shows, one unbroken narrative. In that chapter, Cain says, 
My punishment is more than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Since, according to the Bible, Cain and his parents were the only Adamites in existence at that time, he must be understood to refer to pre-Adamites, unknown people among whom he was being driven forth. And we are told that a mark was put up on him as a protection against those people. This shows that, although we may assume that Adam was the first man into whom God breathed a living soul, he was not the first human being upon the earth. And uh, most of us guys, we, we do uh, agree with the, this, um, this teaching. As Cain is afterwards said to have built a city and called it after his eldest son, he must presumably have gained an ascendancy over those pre-Adamites. Although he went alone amongst them, if, as Professor says, thinks probable, Babylonia was the country to which Cain journeyed, and, and if, as the same authority suggests, the first inhabitants of that country were blacks, it is easy to imagine Cain, a white man, endowed with superhuman knowledge and physique and rendered invulnerable some... Vi I'm going to read that over because I, I broke the, that, part, that sentence... Okay. It is easy to imagine Cain, a white man, endowed with superhuman knowledge and physique and rendered invulnerable by some divine talisman, taking command over those pre-Adamites, and that he did so proved by the fact that he built a city and called it after his son Enoch. We see, therefore, that the Bible sanctions the belief in pre-Adamites, that the oldest monuments in the world indicate that they were blacks. In fact, both the Bible and modern science confirm these assumptions. The Bible, by showing that only eight of, Adam, of Adam's race were saved in the ark, demands a belief in a previous black race to account for the existence of blacks in later history. For how could the Ethiopian, who, the prophet remarks, could no more change his skin than the leopard his spots, have descended from Noah? I mean, these have always been big questions that people have asked, and real questions, like how do all the races come about? This is, this is the answer, guys, right here. Um, where were we? Science, by discovering the fundam fundamental physical differences between the black and white races, has shown the fallacy of the old idea that they had a common origin and that either the white race was evolved from the blacks or the blacks were sunburned brothers of the white men. Everyone after its kind, remember? My claim that the black race was a separate creation previous to Adam may be thought to contradict St. Paul's statement that God hath made of warm blood all nations of men. That's not what the Hebrew says and what the, the manuscripts say. They said um, of, of one clay. It's not one blood. It's one clay, like one dirt, one from the dust, or one clay. That's what it says in the manuscripts. So that's not correct. But he's agreeing with what we know anyway. <clears throat> Okay. I must, therefore, explain my belief that the apostle only referred to white people um, no, that's not uh, accurate. It was not, that's not what, that's only what it said in the English. Uh, my contention being that the word man used synonymously with Adam in Genesis to um, distinguish Adam from the pre-Adamites. Well, that's true. The, um, the man, Adam, um, and then the, the man, um, eth hot dam, the man, Adam. So we know that, guys. Um, and it, it, it backs up what we already know, what we already study. So yeah, this is really good, really good information. Okay, uh, I must therefore explain my belief that the apostle only referred to white people, my contention being that the word man used synonymously with Adam in Genesis 2, distinguished Adam from the pre-Adamites and has continued to distinguish his descendants from the black race all through history. Do we of the present day ever call a negro a negro, a man, without using the adjective black. In Second Samuel, uh, I believe that's nineteen twelve. Uh, Isaiah. Oh, I don't know this. <laughs> Those are a lot big Roman numerals. 
um, Corinthians 16, 13. Um, yeah, maybe you guys can understand those. I'd have to look them up. The word man is used as a distinction, just as we say, like a man, be a man, or he is a man. The fact that the word man meant a thinker. It did, yeah, I, I remember reading that. The, the word man meant a thinker. So maybe the animals don't, well, of course, they probably don't think things like we do and outweigh all possibilities, but yeah, that makes sense. The word man meant a thinker. The texture of bone, the architecture of the skull, the nature of the symmetry of the body, and the characters of, of the variations in these and many other respects, there is evidence of the profound gap that separates the Negro from the rest of mankind. Now, guys, this is the part I don't want anybody to get offended. This is pure. Uh, this is probably from the 18, late 1800s that this was written or, or from people that were born back in those times and people spoke very differently back then. So just bear with me on this. I'm going to go over it as, as, it is, as, it is, as it is written. I am going to read it. So um, just know that there's no ill intention. Why I'm, I, This is for pure education, guys. In the texture of the bone, the architecture of the skull, the nature of the asymmetry of the body, and the character of the variations, in these and many other respects, there is evidence of the profound gap that separates the Negro from the rest of man mankind. And I believe that means, like, um, you know, basically the uh, the hair, the, the, the way the, the skeleton is shaped or something. That's what I think they're talking about. Um, here we go. And then Professor Max Muller, man, a, der uh, a derivative root means to think. From this, we have the Sanskrit manu, originally the thinker, then man. That the living soul, where does this come from? Hold on. Okay, yeah, right here. The fact that the word man meant a thinker suggests... That the living soul breathed into Adam, raised him above some previously created race. In Sanskrit literature, the first man is called Manu or Menu. It will be shown later that the monuments support my theory that the word man distinguished Adam's race from the pre-Adamites. Just as the discovery that a black race existed at the beginning of history supports the Bible's testimony that although Adam was the first man, he was not the first human being. So does the continued existence of that black race prove that the deluge was not universal? Noah's sons were surely white men. Therefore, the Hamites of later days must have been the result of the intermarriage of Ham's family with some black race which had survived the deluge. Guys, you know how we're taught. We're taught that... Um, in Genesis um, 6 or 7, I forget which one, when God tells Noah, take two of every flesh, I believe that included um, even the Kenite, you know? So I believe that's what happened. And I do also believe the flood was, um, I don't believe it was global. No, I believe it was in one certain uh, little area, one certain hill country, you know, one area. And, um, yeah, well, he's going to explain some more here, but yeah, that's my theory that same with pastors that two of every flesh was on there and, and not so much that they, it's because the glow wasn't flooded, but because what was meant to be saved was on the ark, but also in other places of the globe. So anyway, let's continue. Okay. In the Bible history of the deluge, the meaning of the writer has obviously been misinterpreted by the translators of the authorized version. The Hebrew word eretz has been translated by them, the earth, or all the earth, which has caused us to think that the Bible teaches that the deluge was universal and destroyed every human being and animal in the world, with the exception of Noah's family. The word eretz, however, also means country, land, or district and is used in that sense in the story of Cain, who says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. In this sentence, the word eretz is translated by Farrar Fenton, this land, and by Dr. Moffat, the country, which are obviously better translations. One commentator says of the, la one commentator says of the word eretz, as, as in May of these 
As in many of these passages, it might seem as if the habitable globe were intended. The use of the so ambiguous a term as the earth should have been avoided, and the original rendered by land, as in the Leviticus 25, 23, and etc. That the writer of Genesis did not intend to teach that the deluge was universal can scarcely be doubted, for if it had been universal, and if only Noah's family had been preserved out of the whole world, not only would the existence of the black races have been inexplicable, but also that of the descendants of the pre-Noachian giants, the Nephilim, or monsters, found in Palestine in the time of Moses and Joshua. We may therefore conclude that when Noah was told that all men and all flesh upon the earth were to be destroyed, only the Adamites and the animals in the district inhabited by them were referred to. Wild beasts would naturally have been exterminated in that dis district, so we may dispense with the curious picture of every kind of wild beast pr processing into the ark, for obviously Noah was only commanded to preserve the animals useful to mankind, which had been allowed to remain in the district populated by the Adamites. It is surely easier to accept these explanations of the seeming contradictions in the book of Genesis than to allow, to, than to allow that the Bible contradicts itself. Definitely. It is hoped that this digression will serve its purpose in persuading the reader that both the Bible and science, as well as common sense, justifies the hypothesis that Cain settled among the black pre pre-Adamites in the land of Nod, Babylonia, after his, his expulsion from the land of his birth. I'm going to do one more little page, two more. I'm going to go up to 20, sorry. I'm going to go up to 20, and then um, there's 41 pages in this, so I'm going to do half. Each one I'm going to do break in two halves. So I'm going to stop in just a second. Okay. Unintentional support for my theory. The latest writers of the Babylonian inscriptions unintentionally support my theory that while the knowledge possessed by Adam was preserved in Seth's branch of the family in the form made familiar to us by the Bible, it was taken into Babylonia by Cain and there parodied, um, which I think means to, um, like, you know, make, just change, completely change. Yeah, obviously, to change into something not good. Um, but yeah, I'd look it up because I did look it up. I just forgot what it said. So uh, it says, branch of the family in the form made familiar to us by the Bible. It was taken into Babylonia by Cain and there parodied, parodied. To appreciate their support, however, we must substitute the word Adamites for the word Semites in the following quotations. For the writers are speaking of people who lived before Shem and who therefore cannot accurately be called Semites. A seriologist, as far as I know, have generally dismissed as an impossibility the idea that there, were, there was a common Semitic tradition which developed in Israel in one way and in Babylonia in another. They have unreservedly declared that the biblical stories have been borrowed from Babylonia in which land they were indigenous. To me, it has always seemed perfectly reasonable that both stories had a common origin among the Semites, some of whom entered Babylonia while others carried their traditions into Palestine. Makes perfect sense. Uh, Professor Delaporte of Paris holds the same opinion, published the following statement in 1925. If the theory that the first Semites to settle among the Sumerians were a branch sprung from the group of the Western Semites be confirmed, then the Pan-Babylonian thesis falls to the ground completely. The civilization of Israel would then no longer be wholly a reflection of that of Babylon. The traditions preserved in the book of Genesis would not be importations from Chaldea. On the contrary, it would be the Semites who introduced them in the last stage of their eastward wandering to the Sumerians and the latter who adopted them. It will scarcely be denied that these views paved the way for my claims that Cain took knowledge, which he shared with his parents, into Babylonia, and that the inscriptions which have been regarded as the origin of Genesis stories are the result. They also support Professor Cattell's opinion that the knowledge imparted to man in the beginning has come down in two streams. Very important, guys. 
It came down in two parts, two streams from the same Bible, from the same word of God. So basically, Adam and Eve knew God. They were kind of, as it'll show you later, kind of supernatural. They had their powers and everything. So yeah, that's where Cain got that from, from his parents, because they <clears throat> they were uh, not normal men. Um, you know, they had, it'll show us, it'll, it'll continue on, and it goes really deep into this. It's awesome. Okay, so basically, yeah. So Cain took the knowledge which he shared with his parents into Babylonia. The inscriptions which have been regarded as the origin of Genesis stories are the result. So those stories that they've just been corrupted, that's all. That's what he did. He corrupted them. And the, the other stream that it came through, they were not corrupted. So God's going to, of course, make sure that they don't all get corrupted. One more. Mm hmm opinion the knowledge imparted to man in the beginning has come down in two streams one on one hand through the hebrews and on the other through the babylonians that has to be it there's no other explanation sargon of akkad this is the last paragraph i'm going to do we're actually not far off okay my claim that Cain was the great Sargon about whom Babylonian inscriptions have much to say invites adverse criticism and perhaps ridicule from those who see no connection between early Babylonian history and the first chapters of Genesis. Since, however, George Smith, the first decipherer of the cuneiform inscriptions, and Professor Sace identified the Babylonian hero Isudar or Gilgames, with the biblical Nimrod, and since Noah appears under another name in Babylonian story of the Deluge, it can hardly be regarded as incredible that Cain should also appear in the inscriptions, especially as the name Sargon may, as well, we shall see, be the Babylonian for King Cain. So the name Sargon <coughs> means King Cain. Hello, <laughs> you know. Professor King considered that the Babylonian and Egyptian legends were based upon true history. He writes, There is another element in many of their legend, legends which must not be lost sight of, and that is the substrum of historical fact which underlies the story and was the nucleus around which it gathered. Echoes from the history of the remote past may perhaps be traced. To invite at the outset a certain amount of confidence in my theory, I mention here the following indications, which will be dealt with more fully later. And then that just continues there. Um, and I'm just going to show with this last part, because even though it's um, kind of what one of the professors say, it says, My suggestion that is both of these pagan heroes may have represented Nimrod, for, as I show later, the biblical characters appear under different names in the mythologies of Babylonia and Greece. So we'll remember where we left off, guys, um, and I'll start back with page 22. Okay? And so I'm going to try and edit some of this out, guys, and um, yeah, hopefully it won't be too bad and we can see how it went. Love you guys. Take care.